Today we will learn and reflect on the latest book by the Pulitzer Prize winning author, David Kurtzer, The Pope at War, reflecting on how Pope Pius XII sought to lead the Catholic Church through the difficult years of World War II from behind enemy lines. Pope Pius XII led the Catholic Church during the rule of the fascist leader Mussolini, who was an ally and admirer of Hitler. Mussolini was also a friend and partner of the Catholic Church, although he was less of a friend after he went full Nazi in 1938 and started actively persecuting the Jews. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint script posted to the slide here. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. When Dave Kurtzer wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Pope and Mussolini, the archives of Pope Pius XI had already been opened and available to scholars. And the Vatican had opened selected items from the archives of his successor, Pope Pius XII. And this timeline was discussed in our video reviewing this previous book. Now in 800, in the coronation of Charlemagne, the Pope crowned the Emperor. But in 1804, in the coronation of Napoleon, Napoleon seized the crown from the Pope and crowned himself. Not a good sign. And in 1801, there was a concordat signed between Napoleon and Pope Pius VII. French revolutionaries had previously seized church property and martyred clergy. This concordat recognized the Catholic Church and agreed to pay clerical salaries. And this concordat with Napoleon established the precedent that the Catholic Church would sign concordats with hostile and often secular regimes. Now in 1870, Rome was captured by revolutionaries in the Italian reunification movement. And in 1922, Mussolini is appointed prime minister by King Victor Emmanuel III. And you can argue that this was a continuation of the reunification history. And in 1929 is the Lateran Treaty, and that's the Concordat between Mussolini and Pope Pius XI. And in 1933, the Reich Concordat with Nazi Germany was signed. And this was negotiated by Papen and Cardinal Pacelli, who was the future Pope Pius XII. In addition to discussing the sparks that led to the start of World War II in Germany, we discuss these milestones. And of course, 1933, the Reich Concordat with Nazi Germany was signed. March 1937, the Palm Sunday encyclical with burning concern, which was released by Pope Pius XI, condemned Nazism and was read from German pulpits, and this increased the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany. March 1938, Germany occupies Austria. And in September 1938, just a few months after that, is the Munich Agreement and appeasement when Prime Minister and Chamberlain declared that there is peace in our time. But then the German Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia is annexed by Nazi Germany. And just in less than a year after that, in February 1939, Pope Pius XI died. Now the complete archives of Pope Pius XII were opened in 2019, then were closed for COVID. And our favorite author, David Kurtzer, was waiting on the steps for the archives to open so he could begin his next enthralling book, The Pope at War, filling in much of the details on the years of war. And perhaps he should have entitled the book, The Pope Behind Enemy Lines, but he didn't ask me for my advice. And Cardinal Pacelli, and he was also a former nuncio or ambassador to Nazi Germany, was crowned Pope Pius XII and he took the same name to signal that no major changes were planned in his papacy mere months before World War II erupted. And of course, in February, Pope Pius XI died. In March, Cardinal Pacelli was crowned Pope Pius XII. And later in March, the remainder of Czechoslovakia is annexed. And a mere six months later, in September 1939, Germany invades Poland. And after a phony war of inactivity in May 1940, the hammer drops and Germany invades France and the Low Countries. We must remember one important fact. In 1939 and 1940, Hitler had triumphantly conquered all of continental Europe. Nobody could imagine how Churchill in England could once again challenge Hitler in Europe after the evacuation of English and French soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. The consensus was, whether they liked it or not, that the Catholic and Protestant churches would have to learn how to live under the brutal regime of Nazi Germany. No reprieve was expected. Many felt that the war would soon be over with the Nazis triumphant all across Europe. 
And that probably would have been true had someone other than Winston Churchill been appointed Prime Minister of Great Britain. Now, David Kurtzer outlined in his forward and prologue some of the challenges facing Pope Pius XII early in his pontificate. And this is the story of how the Pope balanced his public stance of neutrality while presiding over an Italian church hierarchy that enthusiastically supported the Axis war effort and Mussolini. Also, how Italy's Catholic clergy urged all good Catholics to fight on Hitler's side, despite their uneasiness with the Nazi regime and how the Pope and the Curia had real-time reports of the atrocities committed against both the Jews and the Catholic clergy and the intellectuals of Poland. How could the Church both guarantee the future of the Church while also denouncing the evildoers? After the war began, Pope Pius XII was wary, worrying that publicly criticizing the Nazis would have no other effect other than the increased persecution of the Church. But Pope Pius XII also had to be careful not to antagonize the Catholic faithful in other countries, and in particular the United States, which helped fund the Vatican. And another troubling question, how do you respond to an evil Nazi regime that publicly sought to replace Christianity with a twisted pagan racial cult? Which ideology was seen as the greatest danger to the Catholic Church at the time? Why, of course, the communists. The communists who had martyred Christians by the millions in Soviet Russia and who had murdered clergy by the tens of thousands in the Spanish Civil War? Or was the brutal Nazi regime worse? And complicating this question is the reality that the Spanish and Italian fascists, and later the regime of Vichy France, had been both the sworn enemies of communism and also the friends of the Catholic Church. Both sides in the Spanish Civil War were brutal. Both sides committed numerous massacres. While the communists on the Republican side massacred priests and monks and nuns by the thousands, the nationalists under the fascist leader Franco massacred public school teachers and other liberals, socialists, and communists. Mussolini had negotiated the Lateran Treaty with the Vatican, and he and Franco had encouraged the Catholic Church to become involved in the public education system in Italy and Spain. But while Franco never persecuted the Jews, in contrast, Mussolini went full Nazi in 1939, adopting many of the Nazi race laws, persecuting the Italian Jews. Now why was Cardinal Pacelli selected to become Pope Pius XII? The Cardinal selected the Pope that they thought would most likely enable the papacy to survive while behind enemy lines. They selected a Pope who was a careful, courteous, and cautious diplomat. The French ambassador to the Vatican noted in Kircher's words that Pacelli had spent his entire adult life as a Vatican diplomat and had never held a pastoral position. This had left him with habits of reserve of prudence, a finding balance that led him to avoid offering any harsh words of criticism, which also sometimes led to a lack of clarity and maybe a lack of moral purposefulness. Kurtzer notes, having served as the Vatican Secretary of State for the past nine years, Pacelli had indeed become closely identified with his papal predecessor. But the two men were very different in both background and personality. Pope Pius XI came from a modest northern Italian family, his father was a textile factory manager, but Pacelli came from the so-called black aristocracy, and those were the Roman elites who were closely identified with the popes since the times they had ruled the papal states as pope kings. Now, Kircher has an amusing Plutarchian observation reflecting on the moral character of the new pope. Now, Kurtzer notes that Pope Pius XII, unlike his successor, the jovial Pope John XXIII, preferred to eat alone in his private dining room. According to Sister Pascalina, his housekeeper, who was very possessive of him, and there's a little bit of speculation about her. The little canaries he kept in a cage by his side when he ate sang a particularly beautiful song on that propitious day when he was crowned as the new pope. Never attuned to the bird's moods, the pope interrupted his meal to open the little door and let them out. They flew onto the table in the empty chairs, keeping him company until he finished his meal. Then, one by one, he induced them to perch on his finger as he returned them to their cage and closed the little door. Now, Pacelli was not an admirer of the Nazis by any means. While in Munich, he witnessed the Nazi attempted 1923 coup, the Beerhall Putsch, which tried to duplicate the success of Mussolini's March on Rome. This fiasco led to Hitler gaining publicity and imprisonment, where he wrote his Mein Kampf manifesto, known as My Struggle. While Papal Nuncio to Berlin, Pacelli often hosted receptions attended by the President Paul von Hindenburg and members of the German cabinet. 
So, what should the response of the Vatican be to the news that the German army invaded Poland? The Vatican is an independent state with a press that is independent from the Italian government, although it is subject to control by the Pope. The first response was that the Vatican newspaper reported that the German army was invading Poland. The Germans had gone through a lot of trouble to arrange a false flag operation, so that they could argue that the invasion was actually the fault of the Poles. Now Mussolini was not happy, and arrested Guido Ganella, the offending Vatican journalist. To get him released, the Vatican was compelled to promise that they would no longer criticize the German invasion of Poland. And during that invasion, the Nazis imprisoned and murdered many Polish Catholic priests. And Kurtzer writes, while the Italian dictator was pressuring the Pope to remain silent, the Polish ambassador kept trying to convince him to speak out. Reports from his country were indeed alarming. As German forces moved through western Poland, destined to be absorbed into the Reich, hundreds of priests, thought to be inspiring Polish nationalism and Polish resistance, were being arrested. German priests were being brought in to replace them. In the end, more than half the priests in western Poland would end up in concentration camps, where many would die. While many seminaries, church schools, monasteries, and convents were shuttered, church charitable institutions were closed, Outdoor shrines, crosses, and many other church ritual sites were dismantled. And the stained glass windows is of Edith Sign and Maximilian Kolbe, who were martyred during the Nazi occupation. Confronted by these pressures, Pope Pius XII pondered what to do, what to say. His little rowboat of a mini-state was bobbing about in a vast, churning totalitarian sea. Maybe the Pope could bless Poland, the Pope thought. Maybe the Pope could say that he loved all people, but especially the people of Poland. But this was a time of war. Nothing he could say or do could help the people of Poland, as Germany cranked up the martial music. And much of Germany were cheering on their soldiers. Anything the Pope would say would crank up the persecution of the church in Germany. So, Pope Pius XII said nothing. The Vatican paper discontinued commenting on the war situation. Let the facts speak for themselves, the Pope reasoned. But some time after Guido had been released, the Vatican paper, without editorial, reported how Jews in Poland were forced to sew yellow cloth triangles to their clothes, and how the Jews were being herded into a reserve, a euphemism for the Warsaw Ghetto. But being the skillful diplomat, when Hitler survived an assassination attempt, the Pope picked up some compassion points when he sent the evil dictator his congratulations. But Pope Pius XII didn't want to be silenced indefinitely. Perhaps he did not want to seem weak. Perhaps he knew he needed to communicate to the universal church how evil should be confronted. Now, after his predecessor, Pope Pius XI, had passed away, an encyclical was found in his drawer that he was planning to release that stridently criticized Nazism. Pope Pius XII thought this encyclical was unwise, and he thought that it was a bit too blunt in his admonitions against Nazism, so he suppressed it. But a month after the Germans invaded Poland, Pope Pius XII released the encyclical Summi Pontificatus on the unity of human society. Kurtz's description is succinct. This encyclical attributed the evils of the world to the spurning of Christ's teachings. True, scripture does exhort us to obey earthly authorities, but this is not an absolute command. The pontiff urged the soldiers of Christ to combat the ever-increasing host of Christ's enemies and the Pope condemned any attempt by the state to attribute to itself that absolute autonomy which belongs exclusively to the Supreme Maker. The state is not almighty. The state can never define morality. So how did the Nazi Blitzkrieg of France affect the Vatican? The German generals had tried to convince Hitler that Germany was not ready for a continental war. But Mussolini needed no convincing. Neither he nor his generals nor the Italian people were itching for another war and Mussolini had not sent in Italian troops to assist in the conquest of Poland, well, of course, Poland was on the other side of the Alps. During the phony war in the months after the conquest of Poland, everyone was asking the same question. When would the invasion of France begin? Mussolini was certain that invading France would be fatal to Germany, predicting that a million soldiers from the Third Reich would be killed in battle, with many more casualties. Ten months after the invasion of Poland began, early in the morning, Hitler's ambassador to Rome informed Mussolini that the invasion of France had begun. And to put this in perspective, after a month of invading France in World War I, the Germans got bogged down in trench warfare about 40 miles from Paris. 
But in World War II, the Nazi Blitzkrieg to Paris only lasted two weeks, and in six weeks there at the Pyrenees. Now, in reading history, we tend to view past events as inevitable. But future events are never inevitable. The future has many paths forking ahead with decisions that could go either way. Future military events are even more uncertain. In 1940, the last major world war had ended decades prior, and the Polish invasion was a resounding success. But how would the Germans fare when battling the French army, by far the largest army with the largest number of tanks in Europe? Perhaps it would have been more of a slugfest had the Germans used the same invasion routes that geography had dictated in World War I. Now what is often forgotten is that the winning flanking tank movements through the dense Ardennes forest, thought by many to be impenetrable by tanks, was not favored by the majority of the German war staff. Hitler overruled them because the prospect of a decisive victory appealed to him despite the obvious risks. And the opening of World War II proved the effectiveness of the new technology and tactics of combining swift advance of the newly designed tanks and infantry aided by the new Stuka dive bombers. In Kurtz's words, the Wehrmacht's advance went more swiftly than anyone could have imagined. Within four days, the Dutch resistance was largely crushed and the Belgians were in retreat. The massive German tank assault on France had begun. And we know how the British were barely able to rescue many of the outflanked British and French troops from the beaches of Dunkirk. Worried the Italians would soon join the attack, the French saw the Pope as their last hope. The French ambassador to the Vatican pleaded for the Pope to condemn this Nazi aggression, Gertzer tells us. It was clear to the Pope that this was a war that Germany was likely to win. Furthermore, it is impossible to understand the Pope's actions without recognizing that he had good reason to think that the Church's future would likely lie in a Europe under the thumb of Hitler and his Italian partner. Many were convinced that the war would be over in a matter of months, with the continent in the hands of the Axis powers and Britain suing for peace. Now, even after the successful invasion of France, the Polish ambassador to the Holy See continued to push for a condemnation of Nazi Germany's brutalities that continued in Poland although he was hesitant to explicitly criticize the Nazis. Pope Pius XII realized something needed to be said, so he held a special mass honoring the victims of war in St. Peter's Basilica that would be broadcast on Vatican Radio, appealing to order and justice and equity, a consoling message that was not so specific that it could not be spun to the favor of both the Axis and the Allied powers, because the Pope was ever more convinced that the Axis powers would win the war. Fearing that the rapid German advance into France would conclude before Italy could share in the spoils of war, Mussolini hurriedly declared war on France, without consulting his cabinet, invading the mountainous passes on the French border. Here the French army offered stiff resistance, and Mussolini's troops managed only to win a sliver of territory. And this did not help the reputation of the Italian army. So what was the Pope's response? Kurtzer said that the Pope refused to pander to Mussolini. Mussolini had expected Rome's church bells to ring festively, but they remained silent. The Pope said he would never ring Rome's bells to celebrate a declaration of war. If the fascists wanted to have them ring, they would be able to do so only by force, and in the end no one made such an attempt, because this was not a time to antagonize the Pope. Who would be the next to fall? Kurtzer reports. At the Vatican, virtually everyone expected Hitler to launch his invasion of Britain in July, and it seemed likely he would succeed in adding Britain to his conquests. Meanwhile, Italy's Catholic clergy and church institutions continued to do what they could do to encourage popular support for the war, and the Pope would not temper this patriotic enthusiasm. Now the Pope and the Catholic Church were under the Nazi thumb. Now that the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Spain had a firm grip on the European continent, what news should the Vatican newspaper print? And Pope Pius XII asked Monsignor Montini, the future Vatican II Pope Paul VI, to review his options. The Vatican Daily could publish official war communiques from both sides of the conflict, but this would mean having the paper banned in Italy and antagonizing Mussolini. Or the paper could publish only Axis war communiques, but that would damage the Vatican's prestige abroad. Or the publication of the paper could simply be suspended, which was also not a good option, which left only one realistic option having the paper focus exclusively on church business and religious life. 
Now, today's historical remembrances differ from the remembrances of those Europeans so soon after the Nazis seized control of the continent. Today, we can never avert our gaze from the bulging eyes of the skeletal survivors of the Nazi concentration camps. Although Europeans in 1940 remember the Kristallnacht and the Night of the Long Knives, the death camps were still in the future. Instead, Catholics remembered how the French revolutionaries had martyred Christians and seized church property, and how these horrors were repeated by the Russian communist revolutionaries who martyred Christians by the millions, by the communists who likewise martyred clergy by the thousands in the Spanish Civil War. Catholic clergy in 1940 distrusted both democracy and communism, and they supported the fascists who were the enemies of the communists and the friend of the church in fascist Italy, fascist Spain, and Vichy France. When the Nazis overran France, the liberal socialist ministers fled to form a French government in exile. But the conservative ministers, led by the hero of World War I, General Pétain, formed the pro-Catholic, anti-Semitic Vichy French regime that collaborated with the hated Nazis. The French Catholic Church interpreted this conquest as a punishment from God and sought to increase the role of the Catholic Church in French law and culture. And the Pope approved. When Pope Pius XII met with the French ambassador, he told him how impressed he was with Marshal Pétain. Having been worried in the past that communists might take over in France, the Pope welcomed the appearance of a strong leader who could expunge that danger for good. It had indeed been communist subversion, thought the Pope, that had led to France's humiliating defeat. He told the ambassador of a report that he had heard that as the German army approached, a large number of French troops deserted while singing the communist international anthem. Perhaps the Pope even believed the implausible story. What a difference from the War of 1914, remarked the Pontiff. Today we find it difficult to understand how the government officials in both Mussolini's Italy and Vichy France would cooperate with the Nazis in their persecution of the Jews, sending many to the death camps. But many Catholics in the interwar years were deeply anti-Semitic. We had reflected on how the pre-war Dreyfus affair split French politics for over a decade, and that revealed how deeply anti-Semitic many devout Catholics were. The Vichy French ambassador to the Holy See commented that although the church condemned racism, it had long recognized that a Jewish problem existed, and indeed from the time of the Middle Ages, the popes themselves had acted to keep Jews from a variety of occupations and had established ghettos to house the Jews. And to understand the pope's ambivalence towards fascism, we must remember that many in the Curia distinguished between good fascists those loyal conservative Catholics who sought a close, mutually respectful collaboration between the church and the regime, and the bad fascists, which included Hitler, who were either actually left-wing anti-clerics or bellicose anti-religious fanatics who were strong supporters of the Third Reich and adversaries of the Holy See. There were many who, even after the revelations of how Jews were gassed in the death camps, praised fascism and Nazism for opposing communism. An editor of a Catholic newspaper blessed the Italian soldiers departing to oppose Russia on the Eastern Front. These soldiers were on their way to do battle against the murderers of Catholic Spain, the godless, the irreducible enemies of Christian civilization. Mussolini was seen as a sometimes friend of the Catholic Church, but the Church had reason to fear the motives of Hitler and his Nazi officials. Kurtzer reports, Amid the growing certainty of German victory, the Pope was unsettled by a troubling rumor. Ribbentrop was told to have told Siano, Mussolini's son-in-law, that once the war ended, the Axis powers should evict the Pope from Rome. The new Europe, the German foreign minister was alleged to have said, would have no place for the papacy. Of course, when asked about this, Siano offered a heated denial of this conversation. But the tides of war began to turn in favor of the Allies. Hitler had hoped to invade the British Isles, but first the Nazi Luftwaffe would need to gain mastery of the air. The British had a secret weapon. They had developed an effective radar system, and the RAF fighters were able to counter the Nazi fighters and bombers, winning the Battle of Britain. Winston Churchill summed up this victory. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. And we compared Churchill's remarkable speech praising the brave pilots of the Battle of Britain to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in Pericles' funeral oration. Mussolini had less success in establishing a new Roman Empire. 
The Italian armed forces were the laughingstock of Europe. Both the Allies and the Axis began to view Italy as the soft underbelly of Europe. Mussolini fancied himself as a modern Roman conqueror. He had earlier defeated the mighty empire of Ethiopia and Africa, and early in 1939 he added the mighty country of Albania to the Italian conquests, which did not thrill the Pope. But Mussolini had less luck in North Africa when the British beat the Italians, and Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, quipped, never had been so much been surrendered by so many to so few. That was because the Italians lost, even though they greatly outnumbered the English. And the German army sent to save Mussolini had some successes in North Africa, led by the famed tank commander, General Rommel. With his plans to invade England thwarted, Hitler planned to invade the Soviet Union, so he visited each of his allies to shore up support. Hitler had no luck in drumming up meaningful support from either General Franco of Spain or General Pretan of Vichy, France, and he was hoping he could persuade Mussolini from invading Greece from his foothold in Albania. But as his train pulled into the station in Florence, Italy, El Ducci proudly announced to the Fuhrer that his troops victoriously entered Greece at six this morning. When Hitler fell silent because he was too late, Mussolini assured him, don't worry, in two weeks it will be all over. But the Greeks defeated the Italian forces as soundly as had the French forces earlier in the war. Greece was too close to the Romanian oil fields, so important to the Nazi war effort. Hitler was forced to come to the rescue of his hapless ally once again. This delay may have kept Hitler's panzers out of Moscow. Once the mighty Nazi war machine had conquered first Greece, then Yugoslavia, securing the Balkan flank, Hitler pivoted to invade the Soviet Union in late June 1941 in Operation Barbarossa. Kurtzer reports, before long, three and a half million German soldiers, joined by 700,000 German Allied troops, including the Italians, would face a Red Army numbering five and a half million men. At first, the invasion of Russia was even more successful than the invasion of France had been. Hitler thought the Eastern Campaign would take no more than a few months. Kurtzer continues, At the Vatican, news of the German attack on the communist state was greeted with great relief, for the prelates had long worried about the prospect of a triumphant Russia sharing in an Axis victory. We know the barbarity of the fighting on the Eastern Front. During the course of the war, both sides together suffered tens of millions of military and civilian casualties. By early December, the Germans were within 15 miles of Moscow when the bitter winter blizzards and Arctic cold stopped the German army in its tracks. The Germans were utterly unprepared for the sub-zero winter war. Many German soldiers froze to death. And Pope Pius XII, as did the Pope in the First World War, wanted to convene a peace conference. But President Roosevelt demurred. He insisted on unconditional surrender to this evil dictator. He did not want the German conquests to be validated. When is it best to say nothing? Kirchhoff's book is divided into four sections. In the first two sections, the Axis powers have conquered Europe and are marching on the Soviet Union. In the last two sections, the Axis powers are in serious retreat. And the last chapter of the second section is titled, Best to Say Nothing, which describes a dilemma the Pope found himself in. Credible eyewitness reports were coming across his desk on how millions of Jews were exterminated in gas chambers and death camps like there were so much vermin. At one point, the British envoy urged the Pope to speak out. Kurtzer reports that Cardinal Maglioni responded that there was no point having the Pope protest the atrocities, as the Germans would simply deny that the charges were true. And the British envoy notes, Papal timidity becomes ever more blatantly despicable. And Kurtzer tells us a revealing story of a conversation between a young German officer and a priest on how the brutalities of the war deaden people's sense of morality. This officer boasted of having learned how to kill both the mother and her child with a single shot. Then he showed the priest a photo of his own wife and children, and tears clouded the soldier's eyes as he spoke of his deep love for the family. When the priest shared this conversation with Pope Pius XII, the Pope told the priest that he occasionally thought of excommunicating those who would commit such atrocities, but had decided against it believing it would not stop the slaughter and might even spur greater anger against the Jews. 
Now in the next video, we're going to reflect on the latter years of the war when the Allies rolled back the Axis powers and when Hitler's German army occupied Rome for nine months. And in other related videos, we will reflect on the secret back channel between Hitler and Pope Pius XII, whether the Pope should have protested Nazi brutalities more loudly, and how the experience of the Catholic Church during the war affected the proceedings and decrees of the Second Vatican Council, which was called less than two decades after the end of the Second World War. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. The histories of David Kurtzer read like historical novels. They succeed in bringing you back in history so you can sense what it was like to live in those years gone past. And he is Jewish, and he's also reflected on the history of anti-Semitism, but he's also a fair but skeptical historian, and he does not have an anti-Catholic bias, in my opinion. We will reflect further on Kurtzer and these books in our final video, covering the final years of the war, when the Allied forces triumph over Nazism. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.